Hello and welcome. I am Kim Keen, host of the One of a Kind You podcast. I started this podcast to share my journey of my past self, a woman who was struggling with leaving her teaching career and adjusting to stay-at-home mom life to help other women with their motherhood journeys so they can let go, make themselves a priority without all the sacrificing. And um, we have a special sponsorship today for this episode of One of a Kind You, and it's brought to you by the Be Well, Be Safe, Be Happy, Eat Ice Cream podcast. And so there will be more from our sponsor at the end of this episode. So be sure to listen and check it out. But if you are a regular listener to One of a Kind You, um, thank you so much for tuning in again. I'm so excited and grateful to have you here. If you're a new listener, I'm equally excited to have you as well. The way that this podcast works is that I usually share a journal entry of mine um, when I was in the thick of the struggle and I reflect on what I know now as a certified life coach and what I wish I knew then. But today we're in for a treat. We have Miss Lucy here with us. She is going to share with us her journey from um, having children who were fleeing the nest, so to speak, to head off to university and what that was like for her. But um, I'm going to let her fill in the gaps and tell us more about herself. So thank you so much, Lucy, for joining us. We're so glad you're here. Thank you so much, Kim, for having me. I think it's so powerful when we as mothers and women come together and share our stories. Yes. Because for me, when I went through my, well, I hit rock bottom. When I went through that phase, I felt all alone and I didn't know where to turn. And I think that drove me down further because I was then beating myself up for basically being a pathetic loser. Yeah, I totally relate. And I said um, before we hit record on this episode, I was like, when I saw that you had an identity crisis as a mom too, I thought, thank God, I'm not the only one. <laughs> but you're right. When we are in the thick of the struggle with the identity crisis, uh, we feel so alone, like we're the only ones going through the struggle and no one else is is having a hard time navigating the change in motherhood journey of, you know, whether you're a toddler mom, an infant mom, a school age mom, a university mom, we tend to feel like no one else is going through it. And we're the only ones who can't seem to handle. And when we keep telling ourselves that then yeah, we do really go even farther down because then it like creates this whole other story loop about how awful things are and how awful we are. And I think in a way, we're our own worst enemies. Yes. Because we put up this front of perfection. And, you know, all you have to do is think back to, you know, when you were dropping your kids off at kindergarten. Did you just get up in the morning, throw your hair in a ponytail, put on your track pants and drop your kid off because that's all you had time for? Or did you go through the... I don't want to say the effort, but did you go through getting ready and making sure that you looked all like the perfect mom dropping your kid off? That's where we do this to ourselves. Is that we keep trying to keep up this illusion of perfection when there is no perfection. Life is messy. Yes. Yes. Uh, and it's funny because um, I think I've gone... <laughs> I think when my girls were little, I, I was just in my last year of teaching. So I had to get up and put my work clothes on. Um, but now I think the pendulum has swung in the other direction where I just don't give a rat's, you know what, about the way that I look rolling up to car line in the morning. And so uh, my girls will be like, oh, you have your homeless lady outfit on. And the other day at pickup, I went to a networking lunch and I actually did my hair and I had makeup on and jewelry. And I had something other than ratty old sweatpants and a ratty sweatshirt. And my daughter literally walked by me. I had to call for her. I was like, Lily. And she turned around. She's like, oh, I didn't even recognize you. And I was like, oh, okay. Perhaps I need to swing the pendulum back in the other direction just a little bit. So that way my own kid recognizes me at pickup when I have makeup and hair done. And that's it. Is it? I think that sort of evolves a bit into, you're right. We can slide too far the other way. Yeah. And it's finding that, it, you know, in anything in life, it's finding that happy balance. Yes. You're never going to get perfect. It's never going to be a one in every area of your life. And you have to be comfortable with having that level of uncertainty, but finding the balance. Yeah, for sure. So um, how did you, I mean, you realized that you were sliding down into the depths of rock bottom. Were you able to snap yourself out of that? Or did you need someone to do that for you? No, I did it myself. Yes, I did it myself. Um, and 
it, it's not, I'm not saying that you should do it yourself. Right. Cause it can I'm be not, dangerous sometimes. It, it, and it, it is. And I've spoken to some coaches and I've, you know, I've given them all the dirty details of what I went through and they're like, and you didn't work with a therapist. I'm yeah. like, no. And they're like, how the hell did you do it? I'm like, yeah. I don't know. That's just who I am, but that's not who 99% of the people are. And that's why um, I want to share my message is one, to let women know that they're not alone. And two, to, you know, don't go down that far. You don't have to go it alone. Yeah. Um, And for me, it was, it was a perfect storm. There was, you know, yes, my son was going away to university that was the catalyst. That was the last straw. But there was years of muck and gunk that I had hidden away deep inside that just erupted Mm -hmm. at that point in time. Um, And, you know, before you hit record, we were talking about how, in a sense, we do go through many identity crisis as our kids go through their various stages and phases of life. Um, and life is so typically life is so busy. You just go, 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 go. Yes. Um, but I sort of reached this point um, where I really started to struggle with, well, who am I? Mm-hmm. I had spent most of, you know, the time when my kids were little at home. It just made sense economically for us. Yes. Um, and then my husband was, you know, this is years before COVID started. He started working from home. Um, And that meant that I could get out into the workforce. Um, I tried to piece together a career. It didn't work so well, probably because of all the other muck and gunk that I was carrying. Right. You know, I lacked self-confidence. I didn't have any self-worth. And that was translating into the energy I was bringing to anything. So, you know, when when I realized think that you um you felt like you didn't have any self self-worth because it was tied into your role as a mom no because quite honestly <laughs> quite honestly I had I I didn't think I was a very good mom uh I've, I've often felt that same way and that's where like the lack of worth and the low self-esteem I mean the lack of worth and this low self-esteem that goes way back beyond motherhood. Yeah. Like that goes way back into childhood and teen years and things like that. Um, and then lo- like leaving my teaching career that added to that lack of self-worth and that low self-esteem. But then the struggle to adjust to stay at home mom life, it wasn't, it wasn't going the way that I thought it was going to. And so then that perpetuated it. So um, yeah. And then, and then that same energy, it was like, I was showing up and I was miserable and I was angry and I had a short fuse. So then I felt like I was a bad mom. So it was just like compounding all of these negative things on top of each other and it it made for a disaster. Exactly. Um, And, you know, for me, if I think back, my, yes, I had all the self-esteem and self-worth issues, you know, that's born in high school. That's just the nature of the beast. And I carried that through. But when I had my first child, um, I... I was, I was so lost. I was so alone. I was the first in both of our families to have a child. None of our friends had children. So I had no support network. And this is, you know, my son's now 23. So this is way before things like social media and texting and anything like that. You know, you basically had a mommy group if you could find one to, to get into. And they're not always warm and fuzzy and welcoming. No, they're not. So um, that doesn't, that makes it even worse. I didn't want to deal with that. I didn't want to deal with any of yeah. that garbage, but I felt useless, pathetic. And what made it worse is that we had our own business at a time. Now here in Canada, you get, um, we get a year's maternity leave. Wow. A year? A, a year. Yeah. It's, you wow. get it. In the it's, States, we get three weeks or six weeks. And yeah. Then actually you have to apply to get three months, but that's it. Yeah, we get a year, but you're paid a fraction of your salary. Uh-huh. It's not like you're, you're not getting your full salary. Um, but we had our own business at a time. So mat leave was not possible. So I actually started working full time again when my son was maybe 10 days old. 
wow. by the time he was a couple of months old, we're like, okay, no, we need to get him to a sitter for a few hours a day so I can get some work done. And she just seemed to be able to figure my kid out way better than I did. So it was just Isn't like, that always the way? Oh, that always the like, way? So it's like, I already felt useless to begin with. And then I see somebody else that's being a better mother than me to my own child. And it was just, you know, all of that energy and emotion, I just kept packing down and packing down. And eventually it has to come out. There's no mm-hmm. two ways about it. You can only hide from our feelings for so long. And it came yeah. out. And I think that was, you know, again, hindsight's 2020. I can look yeah. back and see all of this stuff, but in the moment, in those darkest days that I had, I couldn't figure any of this out. And what made it worse is that like many people, I had watched the documentary, The Secret. Oh, yes. I'm obsessed. I, I was, except for, I think the second part of the title is it should be called Secret and Lies. Right. Because right. there's a massive part that they left out. Yes. But when I watched The Secret, I start, and I was like, oh my God, there is a possibility. There is something different. Yeah. Maybe I do have control over this. So I started listening to videos from, you know, Lisa Nichols, Joe Vitale, yeah. um, Bob Proctor. I started consuming all of this great content, but I couldn't figure out how to make it work for me. Yes, same. And so it's funny because I still am obsessed with The Secret. I haven't watched it in a while, but um, like so obsessed, like I was taking notes, like, but you're right. There is a, they left out a huge massive piece part. Of it. They left out massive part. But the thing I loved was that it made me feel hopeful. It made me feel like there was a possibility, but a just flicker. like you, yes. And then I started binging all of those same people and listening to Tony Robbins. I know he's controversial because there's accusations of harassment or whatever, but it was the message that I was listening yes. to. Um, not, it could have been from anyone. It was just his message. And so, um, so yes, our journeys are very similar. Um, but I always felt like there was still something missing and like, why couldn't I make it work for myself? Exactly. Yeah. And so I sat there, I, I, it was this one day and everything was coming down on me. And I started to have this feeling of, I got to run. I got to run away. I'm done with this. I can't live with this pain anymore. Um, And it only lasted a few seconds, but I did contemplate ending it. Mm, I'm like, if I'm screwing up in every area of my life, if I'm not even a good mother, then what's the point of being here? Yeah, it was those thoughts that said, ooh, for me, because I had those same thoughts, um, like six months after I left my teaching career. And then that's when I was like, oh, perhaps I should go see a therapist, thinking I was going to go there. And she's like, oh, identity crisis, three easy ways to fix it. And that was opening Pandora's box to so many things that I wasn't prepared for. But yes, same thoughts, same thoughts. And it's 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 hard. Yes. Um, and, you know, I, I say proverbially, it brought me to my knees. Yeah. Um, And I eventually, I just said to the universe, I'm like, it just, just give me one thing. Like, please just tell me one thing that I need to do to start to step forward, just to figure this out and pull myself out of this tailspin. And I got quiet. Um, And I started to think about if I don't want to be this person, then who do I want to be? And I started, I allowed myself for the first time. Notice how I said I allowed myself. Yeah. Because I had never done that before. I allowed myself to just create that vision of who I wanted to be. And it wasn't very clear. So I started to think about, well, how do I want to feel? Right. And I love- Not accomplish, feel. Yeah, I love too that you like actually tapped into like having faith that there was something beyond you that would help guide you. And like I that I think is and, also and huge. I I was raised in the Anglican church and drifted away from it because the business of religion. Mm, yes. I didn't like. That's just my own 
everybody has their own preferences. It's a no judgment on anyone, but that's yeah. just how I felt. So at the time I wasn't even call it a God person right? or spiritual person or anything like that. Um, but I started just to create this vision, this, this feeling yeah. of who I wanted to be. And what was and, that feeling? You know, it's, it's hard. It's not something I can easily put into words uh -huh. to describe to somebody else. But it's, and again, this goes back to a teaching from the secret. It's not just about saying, you know, this is, this is what I want. It's understanding why you want it and what the feeling is behind it. Yes. So I think I was sort of pulling subconsciously pulling from that teaching. And um, I wrote down five, five bullet points about how this person felt and lived their life. It was nothing fancy. Uh -huh. it was a, I think even one of them was, you know, live life with, you know, joie de vivre type of thing. Yeah. This, because that's all I could come up with at the time. But I wrote down these five things and um, I felt calmer. I, I felt like there was that feeling of hope again. And then the next day I got up and uh, I wrote them out again. Wrote just a few lines about how I was feeling at the time, what I was thinking, did a quick meditation, something I found on YouTube and started my day. And I did that the next day and the next day. And very slowly, things started to change. Yeah. Bit by bit, layer by layer, things started to change. And at the time, I was depressed and unemployed feeling like a complete pathetic loser. Five years later, I'm an executive with a manufacturing company. That's my day job. Mm -hmm. um, my side hustle is all about podcasting and sharing what I created that day was my journaling practice. And I'm now creating that into an online course so other people can start their journaling journey. I absolutely love it. Yes. Journaling, going through the thick of the struggle was huge. And the first journal I actually, someone said, Oh, is this, you know, cause I, sh I actually read my journal entries on this podcast, um, unfiltered. And someone said, Oh, is that like, that's your first journal. And I said, Oh no, 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 no. I destroyed the first journal because it was so dark and depressive. And I thought like, after going back, you know, several years later, being in a different place, like if God forbid I die one day and my husband has to clean out my things, like I don't ever want anyone to see the horrible, dark, depressing things I've wrote on these journal pages. I mean, the other journals are dark and depressive, but not like on the level that that one was. I like literally ripped up all those papers and I threw them away, like shoved them deep into the trash can and out they went. So they're gone now. That was years ago. But yeah, so my very first journal of like going through the thick of the struggle, like just starting therapy is gone. There's no evidence of it. But that was such a game changer for me and meditation and starting to look into law of attraction and like, um, like more holistic things like yoga, meditation, journaling, um, crystals, Reiki, that kind of stuff. Um, and because that those things were hugely, hugely transformational um, in the journey, because I think it allows us to reconnect with ourselves, which is, I think the the root causes were so disconnected from ourselves. And that's what sends us on this tailspin of depression and anxiety and feeling like a failure and a pathetic loser. It's like that ultimate self disconnection. Yeah. All those things that you named the meditation, the yoga, the crystals, all of those holistic modalities, those are based in, you know, what's known as the feminine energy. Yes. The feeling the being. Um, you mentioned Tony Robbins earlier, and, and there was kind of like a eh, feeling about that. And that's because leaders like Tony Robbins, masculine they're very energy. focused in that masculine energy. And it's yeah. not, it's not man versus woman. It's, it's different. It's energies. And that yeah. masculine energy is goals and tasks and doing a go, 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 yeah. go. And guess what? Masculine energy is what most of us mothers depended on to get yeah. through our days with our children. Yes. And if you didn't have 
those holistic modalities built into your life, then you probably spent a couple of decades stuck in that masculine energy that when the children start to leave the nest, that's when, you know, cosmically, let's call it, we're pulled back into that feminine energy, that feeling. And that's why we tend to lose our footing is because we don't know what to do with it all. We don't know how to reconnect. And I think really the more, women that are reconnecting with that feminine energy I think that's where we're going to be able to start to see you know a whole shift culturally in how we're approaching yeah. things yes 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 um but it's funny because I didn't know about masculine energy and feminine energy before I started working with a life coach and um and I always felt like a bad mom because I wasn't the lovey-dovey like nurturing mom but I think that also was because I was a kindergarten teacher for six years. I taught fourth grade for a year. I taught graduate level college classes. So I always had to be in masculine energy and to keep the classroom running. If I tapped too much into that feminine energy, it was going to become a, a shit storm. And so, um, so like I have friends who operate more in feminine energy. And so like when their kids would fall and scrape their knee, they'd like scoop them up and hug them and be like, oh, are you okay? Oh, we're not bleeding. It's okay. Let's go get an ice cube. And I was like, you're fine. Get up. There's no blood and let's keep it moving. And so because I didn't look at myself as like the most nurturing lovey-dovey mom, that was also a huge place where I felt like a bad mom and a failure as a mom. And I didn't understand why it was because I was so so deep in masculine energy that there was not even a sparkle, a little flitter of feminine energy anywhere, anywhere. And so once I learned, then I was like, oh, okay, pull out of the masculine energy parking spot, Kim, and pull into the feminine energy parking spot. And there you go. Like you can switch. You don't always have to be in that masculine energy. Like I I definitely had some of the feminine energy when it came to mothering. Um, but I was, I was the type of mother that would be, like you said, like, you know, are you, you know, are you dying? No. Right. Okay. You're fine. And my kids, yeah. my kids are adults now. They're 23 and 20 and they joke. They're like, yeah, you, you didn't take any crap, mom. Like, you, yeah. <laughs> like, I still remember the one time my son kept complaining. He had a sore throat. I'm like, you're fine. You're fine. I'm giving him like lozenges and here, drink some water. And after two days, he started getting a fever and I took him to the doctors and he had such a bad case of strep throat. I felt so bad. <laughs> like, yeah, oh, it, it. Walk it off. Didn't work in that. <laughs> Yeah, I know. It's crazy. I did that with my daughter. She had the flu. I didn't know she was acting fine in the morning, chatting. Like she doesn't stop talking from the time she wakes up until the time she falls asleep. And she was chatting. I mean, she looked a little pale, but I checked. She didn't really feel like she had a fever or whatever. And she was like, I feel kind of tired. And my stomach hurts a little bit, but she kept on talking. So I was like, you're fine. Like you're going to school. And then like two hours later, I got a call from the nurse and was like, um, she has a high fever and <laughs> she's been sleeping in class all morning. I was like, okay. And I'm on my way. <laughs> and she throws like, in the car oops. on the way home. <laughs> but the thing is, is like, sure. When we become mothers, they give us like, you can, there's hundreds of books. Yeah. on you know what to expect when you're expecting and what to yes. expect the first year and all of that but those are milestones that are trying to fit you know our kids and our lives yes into the little cookie cutters and that's not the way it works I mean how one kid has a fever is different than how the other kid has yeah. a fever and it's just like oh okay <laughs> Yes. And too, like, I don't know about you, but I bought those books with good intentions to read them, but it was like working full time and being pregnant. There was no time for reading what to expect when you're expecting. I was like, I was lucky if I was like, like, oh, I have my doctor's appointment today. Let me just like flip through that book real quick and see. (laughs) But then after the kids are born, then it's like, you're working full time. You're trying to take care of babies or you're a stay at home mom. And you have more than one child, even with one child, it's like, you're trying to get laundry, dishes, cleaning, all of those things done. And it's like, there's no time to read all of these books and then implement what's in the books. And so then that adds another layer to the puzzle of like feeling like you're not a good enough mom. Cause you're like, all the, all my friends are reading these mom books. can't even read not. the damn book. <laughs> right. You're like, I can't even read the book. Wrong like, with me. Wrong with me. <laughs> but 
we have hundreds, if not thousands of books yes. about our kids being mothers, those early years. Yes. And, you know, maybe dealing with tweens and, and that type yes. of thing. But go looking for books of what happens when you're midlife and your kids are going through that. You're, you're basically helping your kids plan and figure out their life. Right. And what I found myself in is that I was starting to realize that I had to figure out how to help my son plan his life. And I didn't even know what I wanted in life. I didn't even yeah. know who I was. And it was, that sort of really started to shine a light on things for me. Yeah, I can only imagine. And not to mention the fact, I doubt that there are thousands of resource books out there for moms who are getting ready to be empty nesters. I feel yeah, like there's... it's the same thing when kids are little, you know, there's a boatload of books for expectant mothers, infant moms, toddler moms. But then when you get to be like school age mom, tween mom, teenage mom, like the resources are few and dwindles, far. Dwindles off. Dwindles. Right. Yeah, so much so. And that's why, you know, I've taken the direction of, of my podcast into focusing on midlife moms. Yeah. Because there are so many topics that just aren't spoken about. Um, like simple things, yeah. you know, like how you're going to feel yeah. about getting your kids, even starting the college application process, yeah. your kid basically hits grade 12. And then all of a sudden you're like, whoa, wait a second, was not ready right. for this. Right. And chances are, while your kid is getting ready to go to post-secondary is when you start going through the hormone change. Yes. So it's, again, you're going through this perfect storm. It's really, really messy. Yeah. And that's why, you know, between my podcast and now I'm going out connecting with other women, other mothers, other people in midlife to say, hey, wait a second. This is what we're feeling. This is what we're going through. And to normalize that conversation around women and aging. Yes. Yes, I love it. And so your podcast is called the Roller Coaster Podcast. And I love the name of that podcast because I feel like that defines motherhood to a T. Yeah, exactly. It's it's motherhood, it's life, it's hormones, yeah. it's it's everything. It's yeah. everything. Yeah. And so we can either get in the front seat of the roller coaster and like have our hands in the air, like waving like we just don't care as we're going down those big old dips or we can hide in the back seat and hold on for dear life like oh, holy shit what is going on I think I'll be in the back well it and you know it depends because yeah. you know there's some days I'm definitely at the front you know head back arms in the air like yeah. life is fantastic but you know I'll be honest the last couple of days I've been a hot mess absolute hot mess I don't know what my hormones are doing. I don't know if it's because we just went through an eclipse. I don't know right. what it is, but I was an absolute mess. So there are life ebbs and flows just because I got yeah. a certain amount figured out. Doesn't mean that it's all, you know, rose gardens from here on out. You still have ups and downs, no yeah. matter who you are or what you're doing. Yes. I always say I like to, um, there are days where I'm like a front seat roller coaster hands up too. I feel like when my daughter and my oldest, well, when both girls go off to college, I'll be hiding in the back with my, um, like clinging to the, the roller coaster seat for dear life. Like, oh God, can I, can I get through this? Um, because I'm such an emotional sap. So my girl's like, are you going to, you're going to cry, aren't you? You're going to cry. I'm like, yep, I'm going to ball my eyes out. I'm like, oh my God, so embarrassing, cringy, because <laughs> they're at that tween stage where everything is cringy. So, um, but I always say like, I like to try and ride the kitty coaster, you know, there are ups and downs, but just like the ups and downs aren't so big. They're just right. like mini ups and downs. So like on a day-to-day -day basis, I like the kitty coaster much better than the adult coaster. <laughs> and I think, I think we can channel our lives to be more that kitty coaster. Yeah. By learning these different practices, by starting a journaling practice, by meditating, by connecting. Yeah. Yes. by tapping into that feminine energy. If we do that, then absolutely that roller coaster is not as severe. Yeah. If you're not doing those things, if you feel right now that you're sitting in the back of the roller coaster and you're gripping on for dear life and you're terrified about what's going to come next, that's probably your first sign that, hey, wait a second, 
maybe I should start to figure out who that person I want to be is. Yes. Maybe I need to start blending in some different modalities into my life so that I can reconnect and rediscover my purpose. Yes. So Lucy, give us some tips. Like if, if someone's like, oh, I, you know, don't journal regularly, or I'm like, not, not a big writer. Um, what can they do to start the journaling process? I would do a, you know, I would recommend doing exactly what I did. Just start to think about who you want to be and write down your five points and just start right. If that's all you can do every day, you know, I don't care if it's three or four words, but just start to revisit that every single day, preferably in the morning, because yeah. when you start your day off, putting yourself first, you're setting that tone for the day. Yes. And for me, there's a lot of, you know, um, thought leaders out there that speak to the benefits of journaling. But for me, I tried journaling before, but staring at those blank pages, I didn't know what to write. Like, are you like, yeah. dear diary, I right. had ice cream for breakfast. You know, yeah. it just feels silly. The yeah. same way that, um, you know, writing a list of 10 things I'm grateful for. It just didn't, like it felt, again, I think it felt too much in that masculine energy for me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I have my five points, but what I did over time is I actually, I made them into power statements and I made them into power statements by turning them into an affirmation that mm -hmm. tied into my why. So for example, like my first one has, be, it has become, I have a strong and healthy body and I am living a long, fulfilling life. Yes. So it's, it's it. part affirmation, but it's reminding me why. It's reminding me the importance of exercising, eating and drinking my water and doing all of those things, but I'm not tying it to a goal, a number, a target, that masculine energy. Right. I'm tying it into the feeling I want. I want to feel healthy. I want to know that I can still run around on the beach with my grandkids. I don't want to be sitting, you know, in a rocking chair with a blanket over my knees. Yes. Those are all the things. And when I'm writing them, what I'm doing mentally is I'm reminding myself of what I did the day before that lended itself to that statement. Yes. Not focusing, not focusing on the three glasses of wine I had. Right. But reminding myself that you had your smoothie and you took your vitamins, you ate healthy all day. Yeah. So it's a very simple process that packs in so many different things. Yeah, I love it. I love that you focus on what worked for you from the previous day or even from that morning. Because I think oftentimes we get so focused on the things that don't work or that we get focused on the things like we feel that we did wrong or incorrectly or not quite right. And so um, just constantly looking for that evidence that shows that you are a good mom, you're a good person, you're a good wife or a partner or whatever it is that you're seeking. And just, I, I think first and foremost is just focusing on that you're a good person. Yes. And I, so I love that you really, really look very hard for all of that evidence to support that. I think that's amazing. It, it takes time and like anything, it's a process. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't an overnight quick fix. Those don't exist because oh. over time, as you mentioned, as you went through, you know, the therapy journey, and you started unpacking a lot of these hidden feelings that you have. The same thing happened for me that you're like, oh, wait a second. That's the inner critic. That's, you know, I'm talking about, um, you know, your inner child. Oh, I'm doing that because of this. You start to, you know, become your own therapist. Yes. And when something comes up, you're like, oh, wait a second. Am I doing that thing again? <laughs> Yes. I'm not it, it supposed brings, to do that. <laughs> right. It brings that awareness that wasn't necessarily there before. Um, so it's so powerful. And if for nothing else, it's a release. You can just let all of that out that's in your head. So you don't have to carry that around with you any longer. You, you know, it doesn't go away just because you put it on the page, but it at least gives you space to think about something else to catch your breath instead of just ruminating on all of the things all of the time. Definitely. And if you're, if, if you want to dump some feelings, you know, you want to really 
cleanse, get rid of a lot of garbage that you've been building up. Just write it on some blank paper and then take it outside to somewhere safe and burn it. Yes. Just because it. one, nobody's going to see what was in your mind. Yes. And two, it's, it's an actual, it's a practice of release yes. and it's cathartic and, and you can get it all out and acknowledge and release. Yes, absolutely. I love it. Love it. You want to go a step further? You can even, you know, light some sage and. Oh yeah. You can, clean it. in the fire pit, you can throw some sage. Yes. I've not had, I bought sage bundles in the past. I don't have very much luck of smudging with them. They just don't yes. seem to burn properly. So I just threw the whole damn thing in the fire. Right. But you're no, like, just I've, clean it all. I'm like, oh, I just throw it in there. I've, I, you know, I've pulled up some really painful memories and, yes. and had to deal with some, you know, traumatic events that just needed to be cleansed and released and you know what I call you know my little fire ceremonies it's it is it is a release and it it does bring you peace again it's not an overnight thing it's it's no you know and again it's it that slow progression that release that growth that journey and I think we need to stop sort of focusing so much on the hard tasks you know, did I do this by this date? Did I do this? Did I check yeah. my boxes? Yeah. You know, just go into the, the feeling and the being. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it really is a process because I started my journey back in 2014 and, um, and here it is 2022. And I feel like I still grow and evolve. There are still things that I get stuck in. Sometimes I just don't go as long. I don't go as often and I don't go as deep. And so I think that's the other important piece of the puzzle is that it's a process and the process never ends. It's just constant evolvement. Um, so that you're always evolving and becoming that person that you really truly want to be that you journal about in your journal with your five bullet points. And those even evolve over time. Cause I'm sure the five bullet points that you wrote five years ago are not necessarily the same bullet points that you maybe write today. They, they actually are. Oh, they I've are. Been, once I got to the point where, okay, this is my power statement because they're not based in, um, hard goals. Yeah. Certain, you know, particular metrics, they're universal. Like the one I mentioned earlier about having a strong and healthy body. Yeah. Anybody can have that. Yeah. You know, another one I have is I'm continuously learning and I'm becoming my highest, you know, reaching my highest possible potential. Anybody yeah. can say that there yeah. is no end date on that because we're constantly evolving and growing. Yeah. yeah. So those, that's it. just, that's just how it worked for me. Somebody yeah. else may want to take that idea and have it a little bit more tied to, you know, the masculine energy, if that's what works for them. And they may right. want to change them over time when they're like, oh, I did that. Now, what's my next step? And they're going to create right. a next one for that. That's okay, too. It's just something to get, you know, to prime that pump in the morning when you're, you know, when you start getting in touch with your feelings. Because, you know, I write my five, my five power statements. And then I actually um, created a gratitude passage. Because I don't like just listing things I'm grateful for. I want to have that feeling of gratitude and abundance in general for all areas of my life. Yeah. So I wrote a paragraph that basically encompasses all of that. So I start my practice with my five power statements, my gratitude passage. And then once I get through that, it's, it's you know, first of all, I'm not staring at a blank page and it's kind of got yeah. me more in touch with those feelings so that it is yeah. a little bit easier to write those inner thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love it. So powerful. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Lucy, for sharing your journey, for sharing what got you through um, when you were in the deep, dark, thick of the struggle. It's been lovely. I feel like we could just keep chatting and chatting and chatting. We probably and chatting. could. <laughs> um, we'll have to, you'll have to come back on and we can dive more into like masculine energy. I think you're going to be on mine. I am. Uh, you're going to be yeah. on mine. So yeah, we'll, we'll talk yeah. more about that. We can talk more about that then. <laughs> yeah. So, but who knows, maybe you'll come back on one of a kind. Oh, you. absolutely. So, Anytime. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I would love it. So, um, so more from our sponsor, the be well, be safe, be happy, eat ice cream podcast. It's a podcast that you should really listen to. Um, 
because the podcast is about setting a new standard when it comes to podcasts about health and wellness, helping you to keep weight off permanently and transforming your life by narrowing that gap from where you are to where you want to be. The podcast is a prime example of everyday people just like you who have lost weight and kept it off permanently. And they want more for their life, just like you want more for your life. The show has a little bit of everything for anyone who desires to live a happy, healthy, and fulfilled life. I've personally been a guest on the podcast and I've listened to some of the other episodes myself about living your best life, keeping weight off, and the transformation episodes for how to keep the weight off. Um, don't just go by my recommendation, though. You should go to trainingwithcoachbrad.com, click on the podcast menu bar for two reasons. One, so you can see the episodes for yourself and see which ones would be best for you. And two, so you can hear real life stories of what others have done and how you can apply what they've learned to your life and overcome any struggles you may have going on. You can also search for the Be Well, Be Safe, Be Happy, Eat Ice Cream podcast wherever you listen to your podcast to give the show a try and push subscribe to add it to your regular rotation. Mention that you heard this ad on the One of a Kind You podcast and you'll receive Coach Brad's free copy of his book, Mind Strong. It's a book all about elevating your life to the next level. So thank you so much. Be well, be safe, be happy, eat ice cream podcast for sponsoring One of a Kind You. Um, if you felt this episode was helpful, please feel free to share it for with a friend because the more the merrier. And if you would be so kind to leave a review, I would greatly appreciate it because I read all of the reviews to ensure that this podcast continues to be a place of support and guidance and reassurance so that we're not going through this mom journey alone. Thank you so much for tuning in and I will see you next week.